Ski there, ladies and gents, and welcome back to Isle 2 Stromovic, the Battle of Stalingrad. And today, we are bringing out the aircraft that gave the simulation its name. This is the Isle 2 Mod 1941. This early variant of the Isle 2 is available in the Battle of Moscow expansion for the current version of Isle 2. And, well, honestly, this is a fantastic plane to fly. This is one of those aircraft that I would actually recommend new players take out for the first time due to how easy it is to fly. Well, not just because of how easy it is to fly, but also how forgiving it is while you're flying it. Now, the IL-2 does have full engine management, which would make you think maybe it's not an ideal aircraft for a new player. However, the systems on the aircraft uh, have a lot of leeway in them. If you get your prop pitch or your fuel mixture or your radiator settings a little wrong, the aircraft doesn't immediately blow up. It gives you an extremely long time. Its engine tolerances are extremely high to having the settings be out of whack, and plenty of time for you to be able to recover and adjust your settings. Not that they're overly complex to manage. Now, why would I recommend an aircraft that has full engine management as being a beginner-friendly aircraft when you can fly some of the German planes that are automatic? Well, it's because the German planes are automatic. While this does technically make the German planes easier to handle, you don't have to worry about engine management either. They automatically manage their prop pitch, their fuel mixtures, their radiators all on their own. It's still something that you're not learning how to do. The IL-2, on the other hand, you have to manage all of this, but you have all the time in the world to play with it. It's extremely hard to get it wrong. To give you an example of how easy this plane is to fly, I in wintertime, like what you're seeing right here, I generally don't fly this aircraft using the throttle. The throttle is permanently set to 100%, and I fly by adjusting the prop pitch. Fuel mixture is also at 100%, and the radiators are usually at about 10 to 15, and that is it. I can pretty much run the entire aircraft that way for the entire time that I'm flying it. Why do I use the prop pitch rather than the throttle? Generally, prop pitch adjustments respond slightly faster than the throttle so you tend to get a quicker response out of the aircraft. Now, flying in summertime, however, you're generally at about 90% on the throttle, 80 to 90, depending on the air temperatures, and about the same on prop pitch. 100% uh, on fuel mixture, you tend to not take it high, so just leave it at 100. And depending on the air temperatures and how the plane is responding to the heat on the map, nah, between 15 and 30% in summertime on the radiators. So, it's really, really easy to handle. Now, as you can see, the weather on today's flight is not what you would call optimal. This is one of those things I was talking about with the in the previous video that I did on IL-2, about wanting some interesting weather effects. Generally, I don't take the IL-2 off with flaps. The flaps act like giant air brakes, but there is a hell of a crosswind running on this map. I'm not entirely sure what speed, but it was more than enough to toss the plane around. The flaps stabilize the aircraft quite comfortably on takeoff. There is a hell of a thick, low cloud bank, and as you can see, we have snow. It is freezing, blizzard conditions, low visibility. And today's mission, we are nicking out to a convoy that is about 15 minutes flight out of our base. The convoy should consist mostly of supply trucks, although there should be a couple of flat beds with anti-aircraft guns mounted on the back of them, in amongst the vehicles. The loadout for the aircraft, we have four 100 kilogram bombs and we have eight rockets underneath the wings. All of these are general purpose high explosive bombs, nothing special about them, we just want to take out the convoy and we just need the blast. 100 kilos seems small, but it is more than sufficient for taking out a convoy. Remember the blast radius is in IL-2 are modelled correctly, so a 100 kilo bomb detonating near a truck if it doesn't outrightly destroy it, it is going to cripple it and prevent it from being able to move anywhere. So, we've just arrived on station, we're getting ready for our first attack run. Now, the convoys in IL-2 don't just stay on the road driving in a straight line. When you begin to make your pass, they will begin to scatter, so I'm dropping the bombs on the first pass. The idea is to maximise their effectiveness by getting them on the ground before the trucks have had a chance to fully scatter and get themselves off the side of the road. From there I'll make my pass clearing the rockets from the wings and then go to the guns. Now as I'm sure you're noticing, rearward visibility out of the IL-2 is horrendous. You have a massive armoured plate in the back of the aircraft trying to defend you from shots from behind. There are a couple of small windows back there which are really more than anything more so you can look back and check your own elevators and make sure they're still attached to the aircraft 
beyond that, they're not really much use for checking what's going on behind you. Most pilots in the IL-2s, when they were doing a head check, at least in this uh, single pilot no gunner configuration, would actually just open the cockpit in flight and stick their head out the window, and you can do this in IL-2. I just didn't think to on this particular flight. As you can see, sideward visibility much, is much the same as out the rear. You have these big armoured panels on the side that block all your visibility. This was not a plane that you wanted to go sightseeing in. Now, of course, the Mod 1941 could have a tail gunner fitted. In fact, it was the first variant of the IL-2 that was fitted with a tail gunner. It's a bit of an interesting story how it got that. Now, I say it was fitted, but it wasn't factory fitted. The IL-2 is often described as a flying tank, and this is true to a point. It was extremely durable against ground fire, with its biggest risk mainly being 20 and 40 mm anti-aircraft guns. Surprisingly, 88 mm guns weren't too much of an issue for IL-2s. While if they did score a hit, they would destroy the aircraft, IL-2s flew at such a low altitude at such a high speed relative to the tracking ability of the 88s that it was extremely difficult for them to actually get a reliable hit in the first place. Likewise, small caliber arms, which were a major threat towards most ground attackers, weren't really a problem for the IL-2. While directed and focused 50 caliber fire, of course, could be a threat, for the most part, 30 caliber or general rifle caliber ammunition would do very little to the aircraft overall, with some aircraft coming back with hundreds and hundreds of recorded hits across the underside and still being quite flyable. Of course, that's ground fire. The biggest risk to an IL-2 was enemy aircraft, enemy fighters coming to intercept them. And as you can see, looking around the inside of the cockpit of the aircraft, well, it sort of makes sense why. Most IL-2 pilots didn't have any idea that they were under attack until it was already too late, with rearward visibility being almost non-existent. As a result, IL-2 pilots had wanted a tail gunner in their aircraft for some time. However, the aircraft was never designed to actually have one initially. And due to things being the way they were in Russia, well, I know it's a bit of a meme on the internet, but the risk of the Gulag or the Execution Squad was actually quite the real thing if your proposed modification to the aircraft didn't perform quite the way it was meant to. So, the pilots improvised. The first recorded tail gunner for an IL-2 was quite literally a hole cut straight through the armoured plate in the back of the aircraft. For the most part, a gunner would sit in the empty cavity behind the pilot space between the back of his seat and the armoured plate with a 50 caliber machine gun and a couple of belts worth of ammunition. And upon sighting an enemy aircraft, would just simply stick the 50 caliber machine gun through the hole and begin to fire towards it. Of course, this gave very limited fields of view. There was at least one recorded incidence where a gunner in the back of an IL-2 using this method tied his 50 caliber machine gun to one of the rails, the support rails inside of the cockpit, pushed his gun out of the aircraft upon sighting a BF-109 approaching in, and then himself stood up out through the hole that had been cut, and effectively started to hip fire the 50 cal towards the BF-109, apparently scoring hits. Of course, this field modification was not as effective as it could be, and later changes to this idea actually involved the entire rear section of the aircraft basically being cut off from the back of the pilot seat towards the rear, leaving just an open cavity with a mount being welded to mount the 50 cal on and having the gunner strapped against the back of the pilot's chair, sitting on what was effectively a canvas hammock supported between the side rails in the rear of the cockpit. Again, this wasn't ideal, and it did have some negative effects on the way the aircraft handled. The aircraft was not designed to have the weight of a gunner, a 50 caliber machine gun, and a couple of boxes worth of ammunition sitting directly behind him. The center of mass was pushed back in the aircraft as a result. And more than that, making such drastic modifications to the cockpit area of the aircraft affected the aircraft's aerodynamics. And as a result, aircraft that have been modified in this way recorded a significant loss in maximum speed. Now, I'm unsure as to how truthful this next part is, but as the story goes, in late 1941, the father of the pilot of one of the IL-2s flying on the Eastern Front wrote a letter to Stalin after having a discussion with his son about a couple of the close encounters he had had with German fighters. Now, the letter was a request for a new version of the IL-2 to be developed that would have a tail gunner so his son would be more protected while he was flying. 
Is the story true or not, or is it a little bit of propaganda? I don't know, but it does make for an interesting yarn. Regardless of the level of truth behind the story, in late 1941, a design for a new version of the IL-2 was drafted up, what would be known as the IL-2 Mod 1942. It featured a more powerful engine to compensate for its increased mass, an elongated cockpit, and this cockpit was designed to have an actual tail gunner. Now, the tail gunner still only featured a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on a mount. There wasn't a lot of protection for the gunner in terms of armor plating, at least in comparison to the pilot, with at most the few panels that were around the gunner only being around six millimeters thick. Not that that really mattered. The way the gunner's position in the IL-2 actually worked, the rear of the canopy opened up and the gunner was directly exposed to whatever incoming fire happened to be coming off 109s. As a result, the gunners in these versions of the IL-2 did suffer a 4 to 1 mortality rate versus their own pilots. But the aircraft performance was much improved as it was designed to have the weight behind the pilot now and the conditions were far more comfortable with the gunners having an actual gun mount, a seat, a little bit of space and a pretty high level of visibility in comparison to looking at a hole crudely cut through the back of an armoured plate. And despite the mortality ratings for the gunners in these later variants of the IL-2, they were still a relatively popular role in comparison to, well, being an infantryman on the ground on the Eastern Front. So, with the German convoy ripped apart and our 15 minute flight back to base completed, we're now on our final approach to come in for landing. Overall, pretty successful run. I only took a couple of hits from ground fire as I was making a low, couple of low passes before we eliminated the AAA guns on the convoy. And thankfully the conditions seem to be clearing. We have a little bit more visibility at this point. The sun's a little bit higher and a little bit brighter and the cloud cover appears to have moved away. So this is much more comfortable to come in for landing. Anyways, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. Remember to hit that like button if you do subscribe, if you want to see more. And remember to check me out on Patreon if you would like to help support the channel. Until next time, fly smart, fly safe, and I'll catch you in the skies.